morning, everyone. My name is Todd Kimball. I'll be your MC today. If everything goes well, according to my travel plans, this will be my final MC appearance in New Mexico. I'm returning to Portland on March 9th and look forward to being back in our beautiful city. Okay. In, in observance of Black History Month, I have a reading today from an Independence Day oration at Rochester, New York, delivered on the 5th of July, 1852, by escaped slave Frederick Douglass. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that declaration of, of independence extended to us? I am not included within the pale of the glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is, not, is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. The, this 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciations of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. Nations do not now act, stand in same relation to each other that they did ages ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot around in the same old path of its fathers without interference. The time was when such could be done. Long established customs of hurtful character could formerly fence themselves in and do their evil work with social impunity. Knowledge was then confined and enjoyed by the privileged few and the multitude walked on in mental darkness. But a change has now come over the affairs of mankind. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arm of commerce has borne away the gate the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. It makes its pathway over and under the sea as well as on the earth. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide but link nations together. The fiat of the almighty, let there be light, has not yet spent its force. Thank you, Al. A strong and moving message from Frederick Douglass. Lakayana Drury gives us five tips for excellence for black students and three tips for white students to be allies. Drury is the founder and director of Word is Bond, a nonprofit aiming to rewrite the narrative between young black men and law enforcement through leadership development, critical dialogue and education. He is also involved with the Hoodies Up event, organized by students to seek solidarity to end systemic racism and racial profiling. Let's have a warm yet muted welcome for Lakayana Drury. Thank you, Todd. Really appreciate that. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, as I was uh, just reflecting, it's been a really eventful <clears throat> month for Word is Bond, a nonprofit that I, I founded and run. Um, we just 
finished up a walking tour series. Some of you may have heard about it. It's called In My Shoes, where we led walking tours across the Portland metro area, nine different communities over four Saturdays. So it's been a uh, really long month. Uh, we had over 700 people. We haven't totaled all, you know, run all the numbers, but over 700 people attended the tours. Um, there was nine uh, communities or neighborhoods, like I was mentioning, but we ran each tour twice because of how many people wanted to attend. So 18 tours, four Saturdays, over 700 people. So I'm uh, feeling um, really good this morning, uh, but also tired from just a long month. So, but I think this is a great uh, way to kind of close out the month by just sharing more about my organization and about my journey uh, through in, in creating it, which is also essentially a journey of my own. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I titled this presentation, A Leap of Passion. <clears throat> and that's the phrase I use when I talk about the work that I do. Um, it's something that comes from both a passion of mine and also just my own lived experience growing up. Um, and this is a photo of me here. I'm on the, let me see where's my mouse at, uh, second, second to the left. Um, just some of my uh, childhood friends growing up and just symbolizes one of the pieces of my journey. So a little bit about me. I'm a storyteller. I'm an educator. I'm a community organizer. If I had to pick titles, that's probably what I would say. Um, and that's what we do at Words, Words Bound. We tell stories. So that's what the walking tours are about. Uh, I'm an educator, but I, I put an asterisk there because I, I would say I come from a non-traditional background in that. And then community organizer is, you know, you could say activist, you could say, yeah, community leader, well, however you would want to put it. I just say organizer because one of my roles is bringing people together and organizing events and things of that nature. Uh, slightly shorter hair in this picture, but same me. <clears throat> so one things one thing that I when I think about myself or even about like how I see the world um, is I, I I believe that everyone um, in varying degrees lives in their own world and then we also have our shared world that we all inhabit together um, and so I'm going to give you a little bit of a peek into my worlds um, um, and I and I say worlds because I I feel like Oftentimes I float within a couple different spaces as maybe we all do. Um, this is my family that I grew up with. So um, I'm biracial. My mother is uh, from Wisconsin of Irish descent. And that's her, obviously the, the tallest one at the time. Um, and then my uh, younger sister, uh, my, that would be on my left. And then my younger brother who is also not that short anymore. Um, uh, that's my world. This is primarily how I grew up. And it, what's really unique about this is that we are all biracial children living with um, a white mother. Um, and I think what's, what to me is interesting about that, especially as I reflect on it growing up is, you know, I never had, if you can even define a normal, a normal experience growing up, right? Like I grew up with just my mother and us being biracial, we didn't have the same skin color as my mom. It was slightly, obviously darker. And so um, I think that really just shaped me was like the absence of my father and then also being raised by my mother um, and, and not, you know, like a lot of people just take it for granted that they're the same skin color as their parents and they look just like them and both the parents are there and that you would never get a question like, are you adopted? Or even yourself wondering, are you adopted? Um, and so when I say like I'm a non-traditional educator, like almost literally everything in my life has never been the normal path. And I say that in quotations because they're, you know, is there really ever a normal? No, but there's more of a mainstream. Um, and so that that shaped me a lot. Uh, so growing up with, you know, we were the only biracial children in our family, only black children um, there. So all of our cousins were white, uh, but also a lot of the world around me was white. And I can get into that a little bit later. But this is my first world. This is what I grew up where we're standing. This photo is taken in the backyard of um, these townhouses that we lived in. And it was, uh, yeah, 
I'll, I'll leave it at that and I can maybe elaborate a little bit later on. Um, this is my other world. So my dad is from South Sudan, which is uh, right below Egypt. Um, South Sudan's the newest country in the world. 2011, they got their independence from um, Northern Sudan, or which is just known as Sudan. So there was a civil war there. So my dad ended up uh, immigrating to Liberia, went to high school there, um, and then got a scholarship to study at the University of Minnesota, which is where he met my mother. Um, and so they, um, from when I was very little, they were not together. And when, when I was 10, I met my dad for the first time. So that's also, you know, usually we don't remember meeting our parents. They're already just always there. So that experience and having that relationship was both important, but it was not like a traditional relationship. So um, seeing him once in a while, I'm thankful for even for that. But was it the, you know, young men need male figures in their life. They need father figures. They need their fathers. So, you know, in having that relationship, um, that was another thing that shaped me. So I would say the other big thing that led me to being a teacher was just the education system itself. And when you're a kid, you don't really think about, you know, uh, the experiences you go through, you're just kind of living through them. And it's not till you take a step back and reflect that you really start to understand them. And not, I would say not everybody does reflect on them, but I have spent a lot of time kind of pouring over my identity, looking back on the experiences that I had and realizing just how traumatizing the education system can be. Uh, the lack of black teachers. So kindergarten through 12th grade, I only had one black teacher. Um, try and imagine, as I've seen most of y'all are, are, are white here today, imagine only having one white teacher. Imagine going to school where everybody was black and, and every teacher was black and you had one teacher in one grade. Your gym teacher in sixth grade was white. Just imagine what that psychologically does to your mind. It does to black children's mind to never see teachers, right? You, your mind starts to form conclusions that you might not even be consciously aware of. Um, discipline and disability swallowing up black students. I would say those are the two primary things that send black kids, students off um, is either discipline because they uh, act out in school. So, you know, when we had sixth grade, we had, we started having detention and most of the students in detention would be black and brown students. Um, I was diagnosed with a learning disability in sixth grade. And those can also, that's another like kind of off ramp, if you will, off the main path of education. And they start to put you in special classes, uh, and you know you start to lose that attention because you're of some learning disability or what have you. And there's a lot of research and studies that show that uh, black students are overdiagnosed with learning disabilities, and that impacts teachers and how they treat you in their classrooms. And coupled in with all of this is that you know in American culture, academics is like the focal point of whether you'll be successful or not in your future, and it's thrown at you very, very young when you're still trying to eat, get your legs under you, if you will. And when I went into sixth grade, uh, that's when that's when school became very challenging for me, both academically and socially. And I would say that um, the white centered curriculum in schools is can be very hostile to, to black students. And what I've what I believe is that by I would say third grade, most black students have internalized that education is a white controlled dominated institution that's not really for them which makes it really hard um, to continue to attend school if you if you subconsciously internalize it's not for you which just makes the success of black students all the more remarkable in spite of everything now again when you're in sixth grade seventh grade you're not thinking of that you're just going through emotions and I, I struggled a lot with school. And I think that that uh, affected how people thought of my success and my future. So um, when I graduated high school, I graduated high school with a 2.3 GPA and no real sense of what I could accomplish in the world um, or that I was even capable of, of accomplishing things. And I think, you know, as I've gone on to be a teacher, 
the most important thing educators can instill is a, a, in students is a sense of belief that they are capable. And that is shown through actions and oftentimes nonverbal actions, you know, and students and youth and kids, as we know, are, they are like uh, hypersensitive to energy and their feelings, right? They're very emotional beings that absorb uh, the responses of adults and adults don't have to say much for a child to know how they feel about them. And that's the feeling that I got from a lot of my teachers was that they did not believe I was capable of being successful. So being an underdog has always been a part of my story. Um, and it's now kind of a, a, a position that I, I like to be in, if you will. This is a, a, a great picture. This is uh, me and my uh, mentor, um, Kevin Torrance. I was placed in the Big Brothers and Big Sisters program when I was 10 years old. My mom, I remember having a conversation on my couch and with my mom and talking about, um, you know, just like my dad and him not being there. And she suggested that I sign up for the Big Brothers and Big Sisters program. So she enrolled me. And the one ask, which was a pretty, uh, I, I think it would be a pretty reasonable ask, was that I'd be paired with a Black male mentor because she recognized that you know, having a male mentor is important. And then also having one that looked like you is also important. And the Big Brothers and Big Sisters program said to her and let her know, we will work on this request, but the wait time, the average wait time for a black male mentor in Madison, Wisconsin in 1999, let's say, was two years. So that shows you just, uh, you know, the demand and the, the absence of Black male mentors in, in organized groups. Now, that's the, you know, anything with race, it's like, well, why is that, right? Is it just because Black men don't, there's not a lot of Black men mentors or that they're just not connecting to this program? It's, it's really hard to say. Uh, but what I, I can say is being a Black man in America is a hard thing to do in and of itself, let alone showing up for somebody else um, you know, it seems like we're in a constant state of trying to catch up and trying to just keep our heads above water. So a lot of times it's not easy to help other people, but having Kevin, I was matched with Kevin, not in two years, I would say within about two to three months of being in the program, as you can just say the will of the universe, fate, destiny, whatever you believe in, I was matched with Kevin, um, within about three months and he had just moved from Detroit, Michigan, and he was right around my, what? Well, I, my, would be my father's age. Um, and so he was really important in instilling a lot of values in me, both mentorship, even political ideologies. He, um, one thing that was really cool about Kevin was that he, he worked for General Motors and he was like a sales manager. And so every week he would have a new car. And that was like one of the funnest things. He, every week he'd, have, he'd pull up outside our house and even my brother and my sister, my mom actually was so embarrassed when he first came over to the house, because we jumped all over him and were, and, you know, dragging him all over the house. And she was like, gosh, you'd act like you guys had never seen a man come in the house before, which was actually kind of true. We really hadn't. So, you know, he would pick me up. He would pick my brother up. He got us our first job. We were mowing the lawn of this uh, black veteran friend. He served in the, uh, his name was Mr. Cash and he had served in the Vietnam, Korean war. And, you know, so he was able to connect us with other black pieces that maybe we hadn't had. And Mr. Cash was almost like a grandfather to us. We go to his house on Saturday mornings and cut his lawn. And then Kevin would give us about $20 each after we got done. So Mr. Cash never knew that we were getting cash for it, ironically, but it taught us a lot of values and seeing a black man, like, you know, again, it wasn't like, it was just like, Hey, this is a black man who's like successful. And like, you should, be like him, but it was like his presence just kind of equated that. And, you know, so, so that was a lot of fun. And the other thing was Kevin would always have like the newest CDs and they'd all have all this cursing music on it. And in my mom's car, we could never have, you know, cursing music on. So to be uh, with him, he would be driving like super fast and listening to music we could never listen to. And, you know, was that what my mom signed us up for? Not entirely, but that's what youth need. You know, they need to be able to connect with people and and uh, and uh, to have someone that can meet them on their level. So, without knowing it, uh, Kevin. Well, 
from us not knowing it, Kevin really shaped and molded us and, and we are all still connected. So Kevin, you know, I, I you turn my the Big Brothers program at 18. I still know Kevin to this day, I'm 33. I met him when I was 10. So over 23 years of having that support and attending my basketball games, my brothers showing up at my mom's house and being there for our graduations and whatnot uh, really sent a long way for what I would go on to do. So 19, I'm 20 years old, I'm going to a community college. I'm pretty convinced that I'm not gonna achieve in school. I'm still trying to figure out who I am as a person, I've gone through what, 12 years of education at that point, and I don't have a clue of really who I am, what I'm capable of, no history of, of self other than the white history that we were taught in school. And so I eventually uh, went to the University of Wisconsin Stout. Uh, I spent three years at a community college. My mom said, you have to transfer over and get into a four-year university. We applied. I was again denied. Um, and my mom being the go-getter person she is, she called the school and said, how can he get in this semester? And they said, they looked at my transcripts and said, he's got a learning disability on it. If you write two letters of recommendation, we'll let him in. So I basically got in the dang back door. At, at a not very prestigious college, I might add, not that it was, you know, the worst thing in the world, but it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, anything grand by any sorts, but I was in, and that was the important part. And that really changed um, my life. And I can't 100% say why. It was a predominantly white school, 100 Black students out of 7,000 white students, or a total population of 7,000 students. So, you know, tiny, tiny Black population. But the combination of being away from home and having professors that, for whatever reason, believed in me. Like, I was the first school I went to where, like, I got an energy from professors that they that they cared about my success. Um, and so within that college, within one year, I went from a 2.8 GPA to a 4.0. I, I didn't go anything in between. Um, and I joined the Black Student Union there, which gave me a vehicle for my first real leadership um, opportunities. And I really discovered how I learned. I discovered that environment matters. I started, was really passionate about learning about my history, reading books like Malcolm X and W.E.B. Du Bois and people, you know, we're taught like two things about black history in school, like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and slavery. And then they just repeat that over and over again and maybe add like another chapter to that. Um, but that's about it. And so, you know, being away from home, being three hours away gave me that space where I was no longer in contact with the things that shaped me. And I was kind of able to really figure out who I am and what I was about. Uh, this picture is, is my favorite picture from college when we had like a a student teacher protest. And I got up and gave a speech. And I think my sister took this photo of me because she was going to school at the same time. And it really just symbolizes the transformation that I had going into the school and coming out the other end. Growing up, um, so my first name is Lakiana. And if you name your child Lakiana, you are asking for them to have a hell of a time in school. I can just tell you on the first day of school when my name was going to be called. It would, be, it would go John, Ashley, Hannah. Then there'd be a long pause. And teachers just looking at my name like, what the hell is this? Um, so I was never able, you know, even with my father being not being um, not being in my life, I was never able to escape. Not that I necessarily wanted to, but I was always tied to my African identity because of my name. It was a constant reminder of of my of my Africanness and not being able to like ever, you know, I could never just blend in, you know, even, you know, it goes to the same thing with being like three black kids with a white mom. Like we could never just go sit down somewhere. Everybody's looking like, oh, where's the dad? Who's the white woman? Is that their mom? Is that who is that? This kid with this African name, where the heck did you get it? Like, and then it has an A at the end. So everybody automatically assumes that it, I'm a girl with if they just look at an attendance list. So you've got the Girl Scouts calling me and asking if I want to join. I'm in cataclysm class and they got me in the girls cataclysms thing until I show up and they're like, oh, and, you know, and then the second question is, do you have a nickname? And when you're a kid, you're just trying to slide by. So, of course, you have a nickname. So uh, I went by Lucky and I didn't really even have a say in that matter. By the time I got into school, it was Lucky and 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 
you know, you want to take the easy route out. You're not trying to have a teacher uh, dissect your name every every morning on the attendance list or the substitute. So that's what I went by. When I got to Stout, I had an opportunity to be in an environment where nobody knew me. And I was reading Malcolm X and all these things. And I was so passionate about like Black history, and African history that I'm like, I do not want to be called lucky. I want to go by my full African name. And if we have to fight about this, what's my nickname or this, like I'm ready to have that fight. And so I started going by my full name. And, you know, to me, that's my most important possession I have is my name. And it just orients me already to my center and some of my ident identity. Um, and it's a folk tale about a little boy with a spear. When I was born, my father made a whole list of all these African names and then gave it to my mother. And she went through that list. And when she heard the story about a folk tale about a little boy with a spear, she was like, that's the name. And it's, it's such an amazing name. And it's just like, no one else has it. And so owning that and having to like, you know, you got to fight against all the jokes from the kids and all this other stuff to, to where you can be an adult. And finally, like, let me sit down with this thing and like examine it, this name and like, see like what I really think about it. Cause you never really had a say. It's just like, you were always just told like, this is how it's going to be. And, and once you just define your identity, that's when everything really took off for me. So that self-actualization, I'm taking control of my life and I'm figuring out how I work. And once I got that 4.0, there was, there was no going back. There is, I, I just had this fire in me that was just like this uh, frustration of, you know, like kind of like a chip on your shoulder where you're just like, all these people doubted me. All, nobody expected me to get here. Nobody expected me to be in college. Nobody expected me to uh, I, do anything with my life. Your dad's not there you know, yada, 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 uh, graduating at 2.3 GPA, having a learning disability. People thought that, you know, you, we weren't trying in school. You know, the only person that really 100% believed in me unquestionably was my mother. And so a lot of credit to her for how I got to where I am today. So um, I went on to become a teacher, non-traditional way. I was, uh, I, I graduated from college. I did some community organizing. And then those jobs ended and I ended up back in Wisconsin. Um, and I went to a reading event at a school and they were particularly looking for black readers to come in because on this read, a, read your heart out event, lo and behold, there was not many black people coming into the school to volunteer to read. So I went in there and one of the classrooms I was in, the teacher asked me if I had a background in teaching. After I read his class, he said, you were phenomenal um, and you are a natural teacher. Um, and he said, you should consider teaching uh, after I, I told him I did not, I was not a teacher, didn't have a background in it. And so I volunteered in his classroom for the rest of the semester while I was on unemployment. And so that was basically like my teaching, uh, what do you call that? Your uh, student teaching, you know, in a sense. And I was able to learn from him, uh, white, white guy, but very passionate about just his students and kind of, kind of a rebel in a way, which I think I could resonate with a lot and kind of just did his own things with the students, took like a week long field trip against the wishes of the school administration, things of that nature. So after that, I used that experience to get a job at a teaching at a summer school. And then from, from when, when I came home one day, you know, me and my mom are both like, kind of like trying to say, okay, what's next? She started doing some like work with youth and teaching, like let's try and see what that next kind of step is. And she came to me one day and said, hey, I saw something online about teaching in China. I'm the type of person, you know, someone says something like that piques my interest. Next thing you know, like I'm out the door after that thing. And as soon as she said that, I'm like, that's the next move. I'm going to China. I didn't end up going at that with that specific program. Like we looked at some other ones and tried to find something that was like, uh, you know, there's a lot of scams and stuff going on, on the internet around teaching and you could end up in some bad situations. So finally found one. Then about three months later, I went to Beijing, China, where I lived for a year and I taught. And in that, that um, school program, I was teaching adult like uh, um, business workers that were coming in like after work to learn English to like scale up on their 
job possibilities within their companies or, or um, like high school students that wanted to go to English speaking universities. So I did that for a year and in there I was able to like, that's where I had like the only real formal education I had or like training in teaching. And when I came back um, from there after living there for a year, I went and taught elementary at, in Philadelphia at a private high school, a private elementary school, um, which is the only place I could serve. I didn't have a degree. So that's where my non-traditional teaching came in. And anything I lacked in a degree or technical training, I just hit with my passion because I had been that 2.3 high school GPA student. I had been the 4.0 student. I could tell you both ends of it. I knew what it was to succeed at the highest level in school. And I knew the frustration of trying your hardest and getting a report card and seeing C's and D's and everybody looking at you and saying, well, what's going on? And just, you know, that feeling of frustration. So that's that was the start of my journey. And then I came to Portland, Oregon, and I taught at Rosemary Anderson High School. Um, and it was not without its ups and downs. I was um, let go of my first teaching position in Philadelphia. It was a split fourth and fifth, third and fourth grade class, um, really challenging class. And um, they ended up letting me go halfway through the year, which was really hard, not being able to like finish the year with my students and really doubting myself of if I was capable of being a teacher. And so when I came to Portland, I had two job offers, one at the school and one um, on like a residential like community center doing like team programs. And I it was kind of a fork in the road of, do you want to keep teaching or do you want to try something slightly different? And I ultimately felt that I knew I was capable as a teacher and uh, I decided to continue um, giving education another shot. And in that choice, I ended up at a school where I, for the first time, really felt valued as an employee and that people were there to support me as a teacher. So this is me in my classroom there. And I've got a whole bunch of, uh, you, you can kind of see in the background, uh, African kings and queens. I found this like whole set of posters. I got a Black Panther poster up there. I got an uh, African flag and I put all those things in my classroom because I like that that wall right there with all those pictures was probably more black pictures than in any all my classrooms combined, you know? And so it was really important for me. You know, I had pictures like Native Americans, I had pictures of, of like Latino figures, like just different folks to show our students that, like, yes, there are other people who created history besides just George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And that was really important for me. And then I always dressed in suits, and my students would be like, Mr. Jerry, why are you always in a suit? And it was just like how serious I took my work. And for them to see like a black teacher and see a black teacher in a suit, I just, I wanted to tell them in everything that I was doing that they were capable of succeeding. So yeah, so that was that. And in that first year that I was there, I went on to um, become part of a project that would eventually spiral into my nonprofit, Word is Bond. Something to know about the Portland youth, this is one of my first days of teaching there, is the multiple worlds in Portland. There's the, the affluent Portland world where we go to brunch on Sundays or Saturdays and, you know, music festivals. And then there's the Portland that's drive-by shootings and, you know, lack of housing. So there's multiple worlds that exist in Portland, just as in any place. Low standards for black and brown students. My, my, my students... Uh, could not stand me the first six months I was in that alternative school because I was like, we're going to do some real work. And they told me every day, we don't do real work here. This is not a real school. And they had internalized the fact that they could not be successful. And so when I was demanding of them that we are going to do actual real work and that, you know, this is exactly what people believe about you, that you're, they want you to say that, you know? And so I had to get over that. But what I discovered was that at the end of the day, the youth push back a lot because they are scared to trust people and they want to push you away so that they um, don't end up getting hurt. And once you stick with it and really show them that you're there for them, they really open up, open up to you in, in a lot of beautiful ways. And I remember like the students that I had the most trouble with, they gave me the hardest times in those first couple of weeks, went on to be my best students and were the most, you know, ones that would come to my classroom after after every period towards the end of the school year. Um, yeah, so the first year I got to, to Portland, 
And I got into this alternative school, right? And, um, you know, I had a rough year in Philadelphia. What brought me out to Portland, everybody's wondering what the heck really got you. Every story has to have a girl in it, right? So, of course, I came here for a woman. Well, yeah, we had been, we had been um, sweethearts in college, and then she came out here. And then um, I was in Philly, and I was, you know, Philly wasn't working. So I was like, all right, I'm going to come to Portland. Um, and, you know, uh, also in the story, the, the, the love story falls apart, which it did. But um, uh, out of that, you know, I, it's just, it's just fate, everything else that happens. So I come to Portland that year and I'm just, I'm really hungry. I'm really like trying to figure out just like a lot of things in life. And like, I had a lot of success in college and then I got into the real world and I've kind of bounced around a little bit and haven't quite found my footing and haven't been in, been in environments where people truly supported me the way I needed to be supported. And when I got to Rosemary Anderson High School, this alternative school, at the North Portland campus, I was immediately around staff that really wanted me to be there. Um, and I, and unlike a lot of Black people that come to Portland, I was in a, uh, in a work environment that was over 50% of color. The CEO of my school was Black. The student population, because they're serving alternative students, and alternative students tend to be students of color, was over 70%. So I was in my type of environment that I thrive in because I love diversity. I love working with the youth that are counted out. Like the whole school was full of students that are underdogs. And like, I'm an underdog. So it's like, like, yes, like I know it. I know why you don't want to try in this math test. I know why you just want to tune out and don't want to participate. I know that feeling. I know like all of that. So I just came in with a lot of passion. And, um, you know, the CEO of my school, when I first was introduced to him, he, he gave me a book and I was just kind of like, I wanted to talk to him as a black leader and, and he's just going to give me this book. And so it kind of ruffled my feathers a little bit. And I'm like, I'm going to make sure this dude knows who I am. You know, he didn't know my name at, at either. And that kind of also was like, just kind of prickled me a little bit. And I'm like, I'm going to make sure this dude knows who I am by the end of this year. And so I would make sure the work that I did got across his desk and I would do like leadership activities with our students like for example the max attacks happened that same year where the two women were harassed on the train and then those men stepped up and they were stabbed and killed and, and those are two black young women and a lot of my students knew them and so we went to the memorial and all the students wrote chalk and it was just a sunny beautiful day and and it was just activities like that that I don't know I maybe they just weren't thought of a lot but they were just different and our students hadn't participated a lot on and so by the end of that school year, I get a phone call from uh, the CEO. He's calling my phone. He says, I've been seeing your work and I've got an opportunity that you, that I think you'd be really good for. I was already at halfway out the door to Europe. I had planned a trip and I was saving up money to do a whole trip for my first summer vacation from uh, teaching in, in Europe. Uh, and I had gotten a raise. That was my first raise I'd ever gotten like mid school year. So I'm just feeling great. And so he was like, you know, I got this, this program we're trying to do over the summer and I think you'd be good for it. And I was like, uh, you know, I was open to it, but I was also like, you know, I'm, I'm going to go listen to this pitch, but I've basically got my plans out for the summer, but I don't like, I don't like disappointing people. I don't like saying no. So I was like, I'll just go and see what, he, what this is about. And it was at the Broadmoor golf course, which is no longer uh, even up anymore. And it was this whole room full of like, it looked like a corporate boardroom and it was all these white folks and uh, suits and I had my suit on so I wasn't too, you know, out of place but I, you know, you just, you're, I'm a first year teacher, I'm just clawing my way into the whole thing and this room just felt a little overwhelming. There's some black people in there too though and, and they laid out this pitch that they wanted to create a summer program that would work with, that would bring together youth and police. And they were looking for somebody to teach, teach it and recruit youth and kind of put it all together. And, you know, I'm, I'm used to fighting over a box of pencils as a teacher. You got to be scrappy, right? You got to, you know, if you can, if you can get a pencil sharpener and a used box of crayons, you're better than half the teachers in the United States. So in this room, all these people had access to ropes courses and digital cameras and GoPros. And I'm like, this is a, this is like a dream come true. Like, and, and they're looking for somebody to like put a curriculum together and, and teach it. I'm like, man, that trip to Europe's not looking too good right now. It's, it's on shaky feet. 
And I'm like, you know what? I, when I get out of this meeting, I'm gonna I'm gonna call my mom and I'm gonna see what she says. And I'm like, I don't know. But as the meeting went on, the trip to Europe flew off just out the window. And I was like, Lakiana, it doesn't matter what your mom says. You're not going to Europe. You're gonna teach this project and you're gonna do this because they were asking me like, do you know another someone else that you could connect us with that could possibly lead this? And I was like. Now, why would I give up what seems like a dream opportunity to somebody else? And I'm, I said right there in that meeting, I said, I will, I will cancel this trip to Europe and I will put this program together. And that was kind of the missing piece to all the stuff because they weren't even deciding if they were going to run it that summer because it was just a lot of like loose ends. It was like May and we were going to try and do it in June. And so on a shoestring budget, you know, the CEO of my school bankrolled it. I made the curriculum and recruited some of the students from our school and some other places. And that was the first summer of Word is Bond. And it was a phenomenal summer. We met with the mayor. That was a huge accomplishment for me, being a first year teacher and getting the mayor to meet the mayor of a city. It was like something I had never done before. And to be able to take our students around and we did trainings with the police. And um, it was like being in a classroom, but like on steroids with all the resources you could possibly want. And then you were also just working with black students. It was like a dream come true for me. I was just like, wow. So. When the summer ended, I approached my the CEO of my school and I already knew what he was gonna say. I wanted to make this its own nonprofit. And I was like, of course, it was so successful. He's gonna wanna keep it within the school, right? Like, why would he let me take this out from underneath it and go start something else? For whatever reason, when we had that meeting, he said, let's do it. Let's make it a nonprofit. And so I became the executive director while I was teaching. And so I would teach. And then as soon as the day was over, I would do Word is Bond stuff. I was, by that point though, my mind was so set on Word is Bond. And when I came up with the name, Word is Bond, I was like, okay, I want this program to just work with young black men. Why? Because of my own experiences I was sharing with y'all growing up. There was never a program that I ever saw that just worked with us. Everything, if you wanted a black male mentor, wanted anything black male related, it was, if it was quick, it was negative. If you was positive, it would take long. If you wanted to go to jail and you were black, you, you can find, there's a million ways you can go to jail in a heartbeat as a young black man. But if you wanna be successful, you wanna find a black male mentor, two years. You wanna find a, a black teacher, you gotta to go to a specialty school that has black teachers in it, right? So I wanted this program to focus on us. I wanted some group of students to not have to share space with other groups of people, not other boys, not other students of color. I wanted one that was specifically for young black men, but I also didn't want our organization to just be pigeonholed into that in the future, right? Like I didn't want to name it like, you know, the black male leadership organization of America. I wanted something that was more fluid, that was also like just hip. And so I was, I had a notebook full of just names I was writing on and acronyms and this, that, and the third. And then I was listening to a song by Nas, a uh, hip hop artist, and the song opened up and it's like, yo, where does Bond, da, 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 da. And I, I just wrote it down. I was like, hey, where does Bond, it's kind of a cool phrase. And I, I've, you know, I've heard it in songs before. I'm like, okay. And then I just came back to it. I'm like, where does Bond? And I'm like, that's it. That's what it's going to be. And it, 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 when I introduced it to some of the other white folks, they were so confused. They're like, wait, what does that mean? And it's, 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 it just, it literally means what it means. Like your word is your bond, right? Like if you say you're going to do something, you got to do it. And, and word, our words are our, are our bonds. Like when we talk about youth and police interacting, like we can build bonds through our words. You've got that famous phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt, hurt me. Um, and it's so far from the truth that words are more powerful than anything, right? Like words are uh, the most powerful force in this in this world so that's where the name came from and you know hip-hop itself I think it's just such a beautiful story because hip-hop is about storytelling that's what it is you know some people get so confused all oh, the cursing all oh, the the beats or the jewelry it's all a story you know we're telling everybody I believe everybody is a storyteller and that's what we do in Words Bond we help elevate the stories of our young black men because our stories don't get told. And we're even told, you don't even have a story. That's what I was told when I graduated high school. That's what was, in essence, communicated to me non-verbally through my education journey was, there's no story worthy of telling you about you. 
There's nothing worth exploring about your name, about your dad's side of the family, uh, any of that, or just Black people in general outside of Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. So we established it in 2017. Our mission as it stands right now is to rewrite the narrative between young Black men and law enforcement. But I think, um, I don't think we are going to be updating that mission statement because our that is a part of what we do, but really empowering young Black men that get started with that law enforcement piece. But my passion to help rising Black men, young Black men who are growing up to find out and have that sense of self is, in my opinion, greater and of more interest of me than just the law enforcement component. Um, though we do do a lot of work with law enforcement agencies. Uh, so we have a paid summer internship program and we unapologetically focus on young Black men. And why we say unapologetically? Because as soon as you say that you are working with just young Black men, all of a sudden the questions come up. What about everybody else? What about all these other groups of people? But then on the reverse, it's like we never ask the question, what about young black men? And that's the question we're answering. What about young black men? What about their needs? And we're not going to, why young black men? Because young black men, because they need a program, right? It's the same reason why a seafood restaurant doesn't sell Chinese food. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, seafood restaurant. You specialize in one thing. Very few things in this world are, are, are just for everything, right? Um, and so, but when we start to focus on, on Black issues, we, that's when everybody all of a sudden has an issue with it, right? It's the same thing with Black Lives Matter. As soon as you say Black Lives Matter, everybody says, well, what about everybody else's lives? We never said nothing about anybody else's lives. We're saying Black Lives Matter. And so, it, there is a, I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but there is a relationship to when we focus on Black issues that all of a sudden we get worried about everybody else getting left behind, when ironically, the reason we started these programs was because Black people were left behind. So we unapologetically stand in that power. Um, this is us outside the um, Pacific Northwest College of Arts, which is where we used to meet um, before the pandemic. Um, one of the things we focus on is professional dress which I can share a little bit about. We serve youth uh, ages 16 to 21. Um, we recruit them out of the school. So we'll send emails, excuse me, or do presentations to, excuse me, students. And that's how we get them into our programs. But then a lot of it's also peer to peer. I could probably not recruit any students for our summer program this summer. And we would get all the students we need because they're all of our youth will tell somebody else, you know, and they'll, it's almost on self recruitment right now. But there's so much diversity within the young black male experience in Portland. You know, if you look at this picture right here, not you don't see one same skin uh, color. You won't hear one story. In this picture, there's a young black men that are at alternative schools, private schools, public schools, all in this photo. Some that have gone on to college, some that have gone right into the workforce. There is not a single black male story, but many black male stories. And we want to highlight those experiences. So we've done implicit bias trainings, know your rights trainings to teaching uh, high school students um, their rights in police encounters, a six week paid internship program, professional dress code. We do police trainings, develop leadership skills, work on video projects, community engagement. So 2019, I made my biggest leap of passion. And I said, I want to leave the classroom and I wanna do Word is Bond full time. Right now we have an office, um, we got a bank account, we got other employees. When I left my teaching position, I had none of that. All I had was my car, a studio apartment, and a crazy drive to try and lift this program from just a dream into a real reality. So when I say I quit my job of teaching to do Word is Bond full time, it was Word is Bond full time with no salary in your house, just grinding it out. Once the pandemic hit, everybody was at home. So I was like, hey, well, you know, I'm not the only one now. Everybody's wel welcome to my world. Uh, we were all working from home. And then when George Floyd was murdered, that's when the money started to pour in. And all of a sudden, you started to get less questions about why young Black men. And all of a sudden, it was like, oh, I get it now. Right? And isn't that crazy? It took such a violent, terrible, atrocious act for people to, you know, I don't get those questions anymore. Nobody asked me why young black men. Now all of a sudden it's like, oh, oh, I get it now. 
and you know all these arguments used to have to you know, trying to explain to people this that and the third and da 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 so that really changed a lot of our trajectory but what is also beautiful about it is that we didn't just start at that moment you know we didn't just spring up in response to George Floyd we've been working on the work so that was a powerful piece of that and kind of a little bit of where we've been now so yeah, we have a law week where we go to county courthouse, federal courthouse, meet with different leaders. Um, we do community engagement. So we learn about black history. This is Kent Ford, who's the leader of the Black Panther Party of Portland, leading the tour of, of, of Alberta neighborhood. So they get to learn more about their history. We do camping trips. You know, you say black people in camping, people are always like, oh my gosh, black people don't camp. Our youth internalize that. They, they believe they don't camp. And so we take them out in the world woods and show them, yes, you can camp. It's yes, it is accessible. No, there's not going to be a giant rattlesnake that's going to come out and devour you, you know, and just in, injecting these spaces and showing them different things because, you know, Portland's world renowned for hiking, camping, fishing, rafting, bouldering. Most of the youth, the black youth that live in Portland, that's not their experience. They don't take partake in those activities. And it's, it's, it's multiple pieces. It's they don't see it. They're not exposed to it. And it just, both of them kind of play into each other. We do video projects, uh, as I mentioned. And here's some takeaways I want to have uh, as we kind of wrap this up. Dressing nice and respectability politics. I, I, we have our young men dressed in suits, but I tell them all the time, and I'm telling you all too, your worth is not determined by what you dress. Will it? Will people judge you based on what you dress? Absolutely. But your worth should matter whether you have your hat on backwards and a do rag and baggy jeans on, or whether you are, you are in a suit. Your worth and your value is, matters. Now that does not take away from the fact that you are black and you are you are going to get judged fairly or unfairly for what you wear. And yes, if you dress nicer, you will get taken more seriously. And that's something that you have to determine, you know, what that's worth to you. And, um, but also be comfortable with it, know how to tie a tie, know how to have uh, put together an outfit and to wear it. But we don't want to, I don't want to send you the message that this will make people respect you. It may, unfortunately, but it also doesn't determine your worth. One thing, another thing that I've learned is the fallacy of both sides. You know, like when we first started these discussions with police, um, I was really adamant that this has to come from the young black men. And a lot of people would tell me, well, there's two sides of the story, there's both sides. And I really pushed back against that because we don't really get both sides, right? Well, we usually only hear the, the law enforcement side or the white side of things. And that doesn't take into account, you know, like young black men are not running around beating up police officers. But there is a history of violence against Black people by police officers. Um, so this idea that like everybody's got a side or everybody has to respect each other, I really think as public servants that that respect has to start from the law enforcement side. And that's something you earn the respect of the community. It's not something that you just demand that they, that they respect you and that they must understand you, especially if you're going to be in someone's community. Your job is to get to know them. It's just like me. I think teaching and being a police officer are very similar. I can't just demand my students just respect me just because my title is the teacher. Now, I do demand respect as, a, as an individual, right? But in the sense of that, I just expect I have to earn the trust of my students, that, that they trust that I'm going to guide them in the right direction. And that trust is something that, to me, is very important. And it should be the same thing with any public servant as a police officer. If you can have the trust of your community, there is nothing above that. And they don't just give that to you. That's something you earn through action that can be taken away by uh, wrong actions. Dialogue isn't enough. So when we do these dialogues with police officers, I'm not uh, ignorant to the fact that we can't just talk our way out of this. There is institutional racism. There's policies and other things that also must happen. There's two worlds. At least for Black people, there's a minimum of two worlds, and this comes from W.E.B. Du Bois, the white world and the Black world. And I was talking to, I, you know, doing Word is Bond has been hard at points. You know, I've had white uh, people who are supposedly allies that have gotten hostile about the way I've, the direction I've taken Word is Bond and, you know, how we go about doing things. And I was talking to this Black 
uh, mentor of mine one day and I was asking him, I was like, uh, you know, why, why are they so upset or why, why don't they get what I'm saying? And he was like, Wakiana, what you got to remember is we live in the white, a white, a white dominated world. They don't have to come into your world to survive. If they go into your world, it's to look around because they're curious. But for a black person to be successful, they have to be in the white person's world. You have to be in their world. They, it is a privilege of theirs if they want to step into yours. And so as black people, we walk through two worlds, the black world and the white world. And, and as W.E.B. Du Bois said, it is a clash of your minds trying to fit your black self into a white world because so often the white world rejects the black identity. And so trying to be yourself in a world where your identity is almost uh, uh, not even acceptable is, is, is a hard thing to do. And especially when you have youth that are, they're just trying to even understand who they are, let alone being in two worlds. And I'll end on being an ally. And I don't know how I feel about this word because I feel like a lot of people can just use it and say, I'm an ally. What does that really mean? You, you can't be an ally in your terms. You have to be an ally on the terms of black people. And a lot of people want to say, you know, I'm an ally and these are the things that I do. But you have to constantly check yourself and see it, who is asking me to do these things and how do I know what I'm doing is actually benefiting or helping or supporting black people. And it doesn't mean you just get to go ask any black person, like, hey, am I doing this right? Like it's it's a it's a multitude of things. There's no right way. But I just I just caution people. If, you know, the intention might be there to say I'm an ally, but just be careful of what are you trying to communicate. And, and are you then absolving yourself from learning? Like I'm an ally, I get it. I'm trying to educate these other people which to where the point where you're like, you might be blind to your own spots. Being an ally is always learning. It's like being a student. It, it, you're always on a journey in life. You're always learning. So to be an ally is not this place. It's not like we go to Mexico, like, hey, I'm an ally now. I flew in, I landed, I'm in ally, you know, world. Being an ally is constantly reflecting constantly in saying you're saying less of that you're an ally and being and doing an ally you know don't tell me 15 times that you're an ally i'll know who our allies are based on the work ethic or what they're doing or where they're standing or when i hear their voice and what they're saying are they standing up to say that they're an ally or are they standing up to maybe counter another white person who's saying something or believing something um that is uh um uh, hostile to racial equity. So I think I'm right at 11.04. So I will end at that point and open it up to questions and thoughts and all of that. And drink Yana, some tea. Thank you so much for a powerful presentation today and for the fine work you're doing with young black men. Really outstanding, very forthright and eye-opening. Um, <clears throat> I'll start out with the first question and the questions are, are rolling in. Uh, I'm curious, I want to go back to something and in, in watching some of your YouTube videos, uh, you strike me as a person that uh, no question is too personal, so I hope you're okay with this. Uh, but myself, as a person with an obvious physical disability, I've always been curious as to who gets diagnosed with disabilities and who doesn't. And so with your learning disability diagnosis, was that accurate or was that, were you overdiagnosed because of social factors? Oh, yeah. That's that's barely even a personal question. Oh gosh, that's that's an easy one, but I really appreciate it. Um, I I don't know what my diagnosis was is, and I do not care. I do not believe I have a disability. I have a learning difference. I learn differently, and my learning difference was because the teachers couldn't refused to meet me at my level. They said, well, he's got a learning disability because he's not getting it the way I'm teaching it rather than saying maybe it's my approach or how I'm doing it. Or let me, I wonder what would happen if we, because I had, I, my, my notebooks would be full of drawings all the time. And I remember they even bring them up to my mom one day and said, look, like this is, this is proof of his learning disability. Rather than asking me, what are you drawing? How can we incorporate that into the lesson? That's talent. You know how many comic books I made when I was in like sixth grade, seventh grade, and I'd have my mom print them off at her, printer at her work and laminate them. And I had all these stories. All someone had to do was look at that and say, that's creative. That's storytelling. How can we turn that into some of your work? Um, 
So I'm not concerned with what my learning disability is. It would be interesting now to go back and see it, you know, um, I, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't care to know it. I feel like it was like this. I feel like it was like a, a carcass um, chained to my leg and I was just dragging around this thing. And at one point I just broke the chain and buried that carcass uh, in, in, and put it away. And it, I, it was just holding me back. And, you know, I, I learned differently, but once I figured that out, that's how it is. Some, now some disabilities are real. So I'm not like discounting that at all, but I would caution, you know, everybody's like trying to diagnose their children about this, that, and the third. And I would, you know, let's just try and meet our kids where they're at. And rather than trying to pinpoint something that's faulty or wrong with them, especially in those formative years, like, yes, youth are just going to be a little wacky sometimes. They're trying to figure it out. You got to give them a chance to, to get somewhere. I'm very unconcerned about grades with students and more concerned with what's their demeanor towards education. So long answer, but that's my thought. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jeff Strang. Yeah, thank you, Lakayana. Um, I've been an active member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in Portland here for a number of years. And one thing that we haven't been able to do in spite of um, black leadership is connect with youth. Do you have any suggestions for us on how we might better do that? I've worked sometimes with the NAACP. Um, it's a hard, it's hard. Um, so I don't want to offer anything that too much other than to say, you've got to get somebody in there that the youth can connect with. That's going to be super important, you know, um, um, or if it's not, then it's like, okay, until we get our thing, can we support other groups that are working with the youth and uplift those and maybe say, Hey, if it's not naturally coming to us, you know, let's let's try and uplift other groups and other places that are and then that like maybe that youth committee can be a part of uplifting those other groups rather than saying like we have to have youth in ours and trying to create something that maybe is not sticking unless you can get the people in place that that are able to do it right because it's like yeah you're like you know the youth are going to need to see somebody that looks like them that can relate to them on their level and if that type of person isn't there, it's best not to force it. And rather than let's just find other e efforts that are already going on and see how we can uplift those. That would be my suggestion. Thank you. And our next question and comment comes from Susan. No problem. You're amazing. You, you're just amazing. A couple of comments, questions. Let me go through them quickly and then you can answer. One is I read an article last night and I believe it was in the about a couple of young men who were, were that, is that part of Word is Bond? I was reading it at bedtime. And Portland Tribune? In the Tribune. Was that yep. a couple of your mentees? For those of you who haven't seen it, it's, it's amazing what two, they profile a couple of young men and perhaps you can comment more about that. The other thing comment I have is you seem to be, Exactly. I, I'm just thinking of all of the efforts in so many states and cities to eliminate conversations about Black history in, in school, and you're telling us exactly why we need it. We need more. And um, I, I've been concerned. I've, I've recognized that those state laws, city laws that are direction but perhaps you have some comments about that and again thank you for everything you're doing so those two things the trib article and the the movements toward completely eliminating the very thing you're telling us yeah so the portland tribune article um was uh, a lot of fun so this past month we had um a project called in my shoes where the youth led walking tours through their community so we had 14 youth do it. We settled on nine neighborhoods. So some of them combined based on the proximity of where they live. And they would lead a tour about an hour long through their community, talking about different spots that they would live at and did things in and their vision for the city and reading poetry. And so 
we had a, a bunch of press from the New York Times to local stuff like the Portland Tribune, and two of our young men made the front page. And I remember we were finishing their like another tour when the article came out. And I was the, the young man, he was reading us the article out loud as we were driving home. And just like such a sense of pride. I had another student, this one was the real kicker. He had been kicked out of his school prior to joining Word is Bond, maybe a year and a half ago, went through like a whole treatment program and he joined Word is Bond right when he got out. And he returned to his school this past February. And he started getting text messages that teachers were showing this OPB article. He was on OPB, the radio show for after his tour in Lentz. And so he was back at that school and teachers he didn't even know were his friends were texting him saying, hey, our teacher just showed your OPB article in class. And what a, what a way to get that in your first week back at a school that you had previously been kicked out that now you've done a 360 and teachers have you up on the projector in front of the room and are playing you on a radio show that you participated in. That sense of power of like, I have something to say that is important um, is um, irreplaceable. And then the other piece of it, the education piece, and you know, the, this battle with critical race theory, and should we even teach um, race in school, and how do we teach it? Hell, I think more importantly, or equally as important as that, is we have to get more Black teachers in the classroom. And it is unacceptable to say that, well, we just, they just must not want to teach. That's just not an acceptable answer. I just, I cannot live that, that there just isn't Black people who want to teach. You know, and for a, I had uh, a student, a teacher of mine at post me leaving Rose Madison High School um, sent me this uh, like comment from a student and their exit survey. And it was about me. And she said, <clears throat> I was the only black teacher she ever had. And she really appreciated that. And she wasn't even black. She was uh, Latina. But that's a travesty for a black student to only have one teacher. K through any K through 12th grade is a failure of the American education system to allow that to happen. They need to have black teachers at every grade. And don't ask me how you get them in there. You figure it out. I don't know. Figure out why there are no black teachers and get them in there. We need at least a hundred, I would say. Um, I, I put together this plan called the Rose City Investment Plan. One of the things I call for is a hundred black teachers like in the next three years. You've got all these youth that are graduating high school, put them into a training program. I know amazing youth that would make fantastic teachers. You know, we're looking for jobs. You need to have the, beyond the curriculum being taught that resonates with people, you have to have teachers, not even just black teachers, Latino teachers, Asian teachers. You've got to diversify your workforce because it, it, it is detrimental to the achievement of black students. When you look at the black reading scores, test scores right now, they are terrible. That's part of it. It's not the only thing, but that is a huge part of it. So, yeah. Very powerful thoughts. Our next question is from David Danucci. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. This is an uh, amazing talk. I've uh, been following some people uh, on, on Twitter and stuff, uh, people like Coleman Hughes and John McWhorter and Glenn Lowry, and they're, they, I mean, I see some similarities in what they express to what you're expressing. That is, you know, uh, stop lowering expectations, uh, you know, uh, let's shoot for excellence, et cetera. But I also wonder, I, I often wonder when I listen to them and I say, yeah, you know, I love what you're saying, if I'm not just, you know, listening to the easiest things to listen to, listening to, you know, black voices saying that you know uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't necessarily uh, be be putting too many uh, support systems for the black community or whatever because they we should push them to rise up and 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 uh, and thrive in in whatever and they're often viewed as as being conservative even though they don't like to see themselves that way. I was wondering if you get any of that kind of pushback of being being too conservative or not being, uh, uh, you know, uh, sensitive enough to the black plight, even though it sounds like you're 
very sensitive to it. I'm just wondering what kind of uh, feedback you get on this. Yeah. Um, so I don't believe that Black people should just pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Right. I think that we have to hold that bar extremely high at the same time pour into that with resources. I'm in favor of, you know, the same kind of mentality that we have around COVID, you know, and handing out checks to people. We need to put money into Black communities and directly into the hands of Black people. I'm not in favor of just like huge nonprofits with multi-million dollar budgets serving poor people. That doesn't really do anything. If I, if I could do the most good, I would give money directly to people. I would give assets like homes. I think most fam Black families in this country, at the very least for everything we've gone through, deserve a home. And I think it's within the, the power of this country if we wanted to. We've seen with COVID, we can do anything to make it happen. Uh, you know, And people always say, well, how, where are you going to get the money for that? Uh, I'll say it the same way when we're going to war. No one's ever went to war and said, where are we going to get the money for these tanks? They figure it out. You know, I don't know where you're going to get the money from. Find it, you know, put it together. Um, so I think that there needs to be massive investments into Black communities, into schools, directly into the families, call it reparations, call it leveling the playing field. Think about it. When How did they settle the West out here, right? They gave land grants to people. They said, you move out here, you tame the land, we'll give you X amount of acres. Homestead, it was the Homestead Act. That's how they got that's how they populated the West. Um, when you think about the GI Bill, you know, we, we, we assume that like the white middle class just established itself by itself, by on its own. No, it was government support. And that's what the government's supposed to be there. It's supposed to help its citizens out. After, you know, everybody fought in the, the wars, the GI Bill, you came home and you were able to get a college education and a home. And we need that same, and that was for veterans, right? And we didn't say, well, what about everybody else? It wasn't even just all veterans. Black veterans did not qualify for those things. So it's the same way. Like, like we, we believe that that group deserves it. We, we can single out veterans. No one says, well, why veterans? Because they did a service. And we, we have to carry that same mentality and say, look, what Black people have been through in this country. It's not just like Black people were just like on an even playing field and they just decided to underperform. There was like things actively attacking them, right? When you look at Portland, you look at the history uh redlining where you could only buy a home in certain districts as a black person like that's actively the government going against you black people could not vote till 1960s a lot of you were alive during that time my mother was alive during that time it's a lot there are people alive that were at a time when you couldn't vote so in order to rectify all that because that is massive damage that people are trying to overcome you have to pour into those communities. So I'm not, in I'm not in favor of any pull your bootstraps up mentality other than keep your, keep the bar high for us. But at the same time, you have to help. And that's what I think the role of the government is the same way with children. It's up to the parents to help make sure that they are supported and are set up for success. And I do not believe this country is truly setting up black people to succeed at the levels they need to do. We just got our first black woman Supreme Court justice. I guess that's something to be happy about, but what the hell does that say about our country that it's 200 years later, we just got the first black woman, the first black woman, like one black woman, like, you know, so we've got to do something different. We've got to do massive investments and it's going to be maybe a little contrary to the American idea of just like everybody works for their dollar, but that's not, that never happened. Nobody ever just worked for their dollar. There was a lot of free labor there was handouts to support people to build up middle, the middle white class. And that same mentality needs to happen for, for the black community. Lakiana, I think that's a great note to end on. It is just past 1120. I'll tell you that we have afterthoughts after some brief housekeeping and announcements for our organization. You're welcome to stay with us and uh, continue the dialogue. I do wanna let you, I can tell you that you moved a lot of people today with your presentation. And the humanists, uh, a lot of us are retired people with, with time and uh, resources to help. So I'll give you a last word on anything we can do to help your organization. Um, we're going to Washington DC next month, taking 11 ambassadors, uh, youth. Uh, it's our first national trip. So 
I'll drop our website in there. You can donate to support. But what I would also just like is just spread the message, you know, as you're talking to foundations or people that are looking to support Black projects in Portland, um, please consider Word is Bond. And I just appreciate everybody listening, keeping an open mind. I'm sure I've said things today that maybe challenged some ideas you had. And I'm not in any way claiming I am right 100% of the time. I think we all have a piece of the truth. Um, but I'm just sharing my world and my experience. And what you can do for us is helping donate and helping just spread the word about what Word is Bond is doing. Lakayana, thank you so much for your time today and thank for you. the great work you're doing in our community.